Welcome to the webinar, Increasing International Opportunities in India's Consumer Business. My name is Supriya Pandey, and I am a Senior Global Consultant with Amrit. Before we begin the presentation, I just want to go over a few logistical details. If you're logged in, you should see before you the first slide of the presentation. Please do not minimize the screen and make sure that you can see the entire screen on your monitor. You will also see a webinar applet that will allow you to send us questions to the session. Uh, it's the same applet that uh, we have also been sending you um, little uh, trivia notes on. The speaker, Gunjan Bagla, will answer the questions either through the course of the session or at the very end. In case you run into any technical issues, please call 1-805-617-7000. You might be asked for a meeting ID, which you can retrieve from the confirmation email we sent you, and it is also available at the bottom of your webinar applet. During the course of the webinar, if time permits, we might conduct a few interactive polls, and we would really appreciate your participation. If you have any questions after the webinar, you can always email us at usa at amrit.com. I would now like to go ahead and introduce our featured speaker. You might know that global consumer companies which trust Amrit's India expertise include companies like Clorox, Gojo, Johnson & Johnson, Paramount Farms, Reckitt Benkiser. Our speaker today has helped executives from each of these companies. When the Wall Street Journal and the Harvard Business Review need insights on India, they turn to Gunjan Bagla for comments and articles. When the National Public Radio and BBC TV need a voice or a face who can explain India to the West, they turn again to Gunjan Bagla. His latest piece for the Harvard Business Review appeared just before Christmas, entitled, How U.S. Businesses Can Succeed in India in 2015. Gunjan has an MBA with honors from Southern Illinois University and a mechanical engineering degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in India. He was president of the Alumni Association of the IITs for three years and is author of the top-rated book, Doing Business in 21st Century India. So now, here's Gunjan. Thank you, Supriya, and welcome to all of you on the phone from all over the world who have joined on this webinar. A few years ago, I was approached by a Southern California company that is the world's largest grower of pistachios. It's called Paramount Farms, and you might have seen their product in the grocery section of your, uh, of your in the produce section of your favorite grocery store uh, with the brand name Wonderful. But they also sell their product through many, many other channels. Almost two-thirds or three-fourths of the products sold in the U.S. in any given year is actually processed or grown by Paramount Farms. They had no business in India at that point, and they came to us for guidance. So we enabled their first trip to India and helped them make the first few wholesale sales of, uh, of a product uh, by container. And then we helped them hire a team in India to be able to expand their operations and grow the business on the ground, both for their wholesale as well as their branded product. On the left, you see one of their billboard ads outside uh, the large shopping mall in, uh, in the New Delhi area. And on the right, you see their first small factory that they set up to roast California-grown pistachios and package them in the, uh, you know, in, in the city of Baroda, just uh, on the western part of India. Uh, they have since moved to a larger facility where they continue to roast and package the raw pistachios that are shipped from the U.S. to India. A big chunk of their business continues to be wholesale. Today, their success in India is, can be seen over 12,000 outlets all across the country. And today, they are also uh, the strong presence uh, and have displaced much of the Iranian product that was being imported uh, for the last century into India. So it's been a great success story for us. A lot of planning went into making this success happen. And uh, while I can't get into the specific confidential details of this client, I will share some of the general wisdoms that we have learned in dealing with many, many other clients and taking them to India or advising them against going to India or advising them to go slow or whatever. So why, why is this an important subject today? Uh, so let's, let's uh, focus on that. So first of all, you might know that 
President Obama is making his second trip to India in just about 10 days. This is the first time that a sitting American president in history will have made two trips to India while they are in office. And the president's time, as you know, is extremely precious and valuable. The reason that President Obama is making this investment to, to fly halfway across the world is because the administration recognizes the importance of India to U.S. political and diplomatic interests, but equally to U.S. commercial interests. In fact, Secretary John Kerry, as you saw in the trivia, was in, was in India just a couple of days ago, and the trip was all about business. He, he actually was at, a, at a, the vibrant Gujarat uh, investment summit in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the state of Gujarat, at the, in the capital called Gandhinagar. Uh, and uh, it's very likely that uh, Penny Prisker, our Commerce Secretary, will accompany President Obama on the trip uh, in 10 days. She was already in India uh, a few months ago, uh, I, I believe in August uh, last year. Currently, the bilateral trade between the two countries is about 100 billion. I wrote an article for Business Week about six years ago where when the trade was only 20 billion and I predicted that India's trade with the US would grow very rapidly and that has held out to be true. So a target of 500 billion seems unattainable today, but 100 billion seemed equally unattainable five or six years ago. So I think this is a country that you need to watch. In the consumer business, this is particularly important because this consumer market in India is growing at between 13 to 20 percent. We'll talk about some of the reasons why it's growing faster than overall GDP in India. The predictions by McKinsey and other firms are that India will be the fifth largest consumer market in the world by 2025. And just in 2014, India exceeded Japan's economy by purchasing power parity. So only China and the US are larger economies than India in terms of purchasing power parity. We think that 2015 is a turning point and that decisions that your company might make or you might make uh, for uh, looking at India will be key in determining the success of your operation across the next five to ten years. Uh, those who wait will may end up falling behind because of the forces that we see at play in India. Just briefly about our company, we are experts in globalization focused on India. Many of our clients are global 2000 companies, but we work with many, many smaller companies as well. We offer services around market access, around sourcing, and our, we also teach workshops on doing business in India. We help people buy companies in India if necessary. And the consumer business is a big part of our overall consulting. So, Supriya, can we run our first poll at this point? Yes, Sinjin, I'm going to go ahead and run it right now. So our first poll, um, is uh, primarily about your primary interest in India uh, for this webinar. So if everyone could go ahead and please submit your vote, um, we can close out and move on with the webinar. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send us to the questions applet. Um, that is part of the webinar applet. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, Gunjan, and share the results. So the question was, what is your primary interest in India for this webinar? And we have 67% uh, looking into selling to India's consumers. Uh, no one uh, is interested in leveraging India's technical and engineering talent for the West. And we have 17% who would like to uh, source ingredients, packaging, products for Western use. And uh, we have a couple who are uh, none of the above. OK, okay great. So I will focus most of my effort on the selling part. We will address sourcing towards the end. I have several slides dealing with engineering talent in India. We've done a, quite a bit of work for many large consumer products companies who have leveraged that. But I won't address any of that in the, in the verbal comments. Those slides will be included for those who request an email of the, of the slide set. So you will have access to that material as well. Let's get going. So we will do a quick overview. 
then we'll talk about the four P's of marketing applied to India. And like I said, we'll skip over the R&D collaboration section, and we will then talk about sourcing from India. For those interested in sourcing, I would especially recommend that you send me some detailed questions so that I can address them since we don't have a lot of material on sourcing in this particular configuration. But I do want to take care of you uh, through the interactive questions. We've done many, many engagements around sourcing from India. So that's something that I can speak with, with some authority about. One message that you need to remember is that the average Indian consumer loves the United States. This is visible in the picture on the top left, which I took in the city of Chennai. Uh, you can see that uh, snow globe with a recognizable Hollywood sign, Golden Gate Bridge, and the Statue of Liberty. You'll notice that these, these icons are used with the assumption that the Indian consumer knows exactly what those things mean. And the reason that I want to emphasize this is that a similar picture of something in the UK might work with Trafalgar Square and and, and some of the images, but it's very unlikely that the average Indian consumer would recognize uh, iconic images from any other country. And so there is this affinity towards America that I think you can take advantage of in your work. It's also shown on the graph on the right, where the uh, research from Ipsos asks people all over the world, what was their view of the United States? And you see that India ranks way up there with uh, well over 70% of Indians having a favorable or mainly favorable view of the United States. Uh, whereas some of our great allies like Great Britain and Spain and South Korea and Japan rank way down here. And many of the BRIC countries such as Brazil and China rank much lower than India. This is not just Ipsos. There's a more recent study by the Pew Center out of Washington DC and they found that only 10% of Indian consumers have a negative view of the United States. And so you have 90% of the market in India who is keen to think positively about the United States and about American companies, American brands, American lifestyle. People aspire to that. So if you are a consumer product company, you can take advantage of this uh, going into the Indian market. India has very compelling demographics. It's a country of 1.2 billion people. The urban population is about 300 million, so roughly equivalent to the United States. But one very significant thing about India compared to other markets is that it's a young country. Most of India is under 25 years of age. And these are people who have not yet formed their brand preferences and are open to new brands. So that's something that you can take advantage of. It's a very diverse country with over 23 official languages written in many, many different scripts. So if you compare Hindi, which is spoken in northern India, to Tamil or Telugu in southern India, not only can you not understand the language if you're a Hindi speaker, you can't even read the letters. In fact, Tamil and Telugu have different scripts. And Bengali has a different script, and, and Malayalam does, and so on. So it is a, it is a very diverse country. Uh, I think of it as you might think of Europe. Business in India is generally run in English. So, so is the federal government for the most part. But it's Indian English, not American English. And the way people communicate in words and the way they string together thoughts can be different. So that's a subject we can get into during the Q&A if necessary. For many new entrants to India, the largest cities are the first places you want to play. And you have access to a market of 60 million people just among the top six cities, Mumbai in the west which is India's commercial, industrial, and entertainment capital, and the place where its stock exchanges are located. It's uh, many of the largest companies are headquartered. Delhi, which used to be mostly about politics and bureaucracy, but now has considerable industry in the suburbs around Delhi, much uh, you know, much like Washington DC uh, and the areas around in, in in Maryland and Virginia. It's a similar kind of approach. In the south of India where there's been a lot of growth. There are three major cities, Chennai, which is on the Bay of Bengal, and Bangalore, which is at an altitude in the middle part of the Deccan Peninsula, and Hyderabad, which is a little bit north uh, of, uh, of Bangalore. All three are vibrant cities with IT, pharmaceutical, automotive, and telecom industries, and all doing very well. In the east is the city of Kolkata, previously known as Calcutta, and that used to be the capital of India 
for many years when the British, uh, or specifically the British East India Company ruled the country. They used to rule it from Calcutta, and at that point it was India's most prosperous city. That is no longer the case, but uh, it is still a major urban center. Let's take a look at some of the companies in India. And this is a partial list. We have not listed all the major companies. But you see at the top of the list are foreign companies. Unilever, which has an affiliate company in India called Hindustan Unilever. And about 15% of the value of Unilever overall is contributed by its Indian business. Uh, they are the 800-pound gorilla in the Indian consumer market with sales of over $4 billion. Nestle has been in India for a long time as well, Swiss company and their sales exceed a billion dollars. ITC is an Indian company, but a good chunk of it, over 50% is owned by a British company, and their consumer product business alone is over a billion dollars. They are into many other businesses, including hotels and shipping and, and some industrial products. We are not counting that here. Then you'll see a list of companies that you may not recognize if you don't know India. So uh, Britannia makes cookies. They used to have a collaboration with a foreign company, but no more. Dabur, in North India is exclusively a traditional Ayurvedic uh, uh, Indian products company. They are now run by a very sophisticated management team, and uh, their revenues are approaching a billion dollars now. Headquartered in Mumbai is a company that used to make only coconut hair oil. Most of their revenues used to come from that one single product, but now they have diversified, and its, uh, it's CEO is one of India's billionaires. Uh, they are now active in many, many different uh, sectors of India's consumer business. One of the American companies that has been in India a long while and has done very well is Colgate Palmolive. Uh, they have a listed or a traded company in India as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later on. At the low end is a detergent company that competes directly with Levers and Procter and Gamble called Nirma. Uh, they have a huge amount of business with just the detergent products. Uh, typically targeting the low end of the market, but doing extremely well. And then I won't go into all of the other companies. Uh, I just mentioned Godrej has quite a bit of a business in, uh, in Latin America and, and some business in Africa outside of their business in India as well. I, I would think about 10 to 15 percent of their sales are from those countries. So Indian companies do have multinational uh, goals at this point. There are other American companies that are hugely successful. We'll talk about Amway. We'll talk about some of the others as we go on, and I can answer questions about that as well. So why is India growing so rapidly, and why is India's consumer market growing rap more rapidly than the overall economy? Let me list some of the factors. So first of all, the Indian economy is growing, and the per capita income is rising rapidly. If you go back 20, 25 years, most of Indian consumer spending was really on basic food. And personal care, home care items were very limited when you look at the overall population. That is starting to change. We took one of our home care clients to India some time ago, about three years ago, and we took them into the homes of rich, middle class, and, and lower income Indian consumers, and they could see how the, one, of the, one of the people commented that as you rise up the income scale, people use more and more different products. Uh, and, and that has been a trend tendency we've seen over time as well. So, uh, so that, that's driven by per capita income increasing. But at the same time, what is happening is India used to be largely a rural country, and it still is to some extent, but is rapidly urbanizing. As people move to the cities, they tend to consume more packaged products rather than things that are grown out of the ground or, 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 or handmade and so on, or not manufactured in, 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 in a factory. And so this, this movement is causing essentially the creation of a new market. Over 200 million new customers have moved to the cities over the period of five years. So that's, that's a big factor. The third factor for you as a new entrant from the US is that India is one of the youngest countries, as I mentioned earlier. And these young people have aspirations that very much match the aspirations of American young people. And so they, they may not use the same brands that their parents and grandparents used. They're much more, uh, much more entranced by American culture, American lifestyle, and American brands. So you can take advantage of that. And finally, India is a culture that hives on the movies and, and glamour and entertainment. And the prevalence of Indian 
movies as well as Indian television shows which have grown uh, quite dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years are also driving the aspirational consumption. Hollywood movies are shown in India but not, you know, they are not, certainly not the big revenue generator that Indian movies are in. Bollywood as India's, India's movie business is called has produced more movies than Hollywood for the last 20-25 years and continues to grow very rapidly. So keep that in mind. So let me talk about one little anecdote about Colgate Palmolive, who's been in India for for more than 50 years. Uh, in recent years, they've seen a lot of competitive pressure from the companies, the likes of Dabur, whom I mentioned earlier, as well as Procter and Gamble and others. So they decided that they wanted to start segmenting the market more. Uh, than they had done before. And one of the trends they saw in India that's similar to what, what we've seen in the US is a tendency towards well-being and wellness. And they leveraged that in the toothpaste business by launching a brand that they, they entitled the Sensitive Pro Relief Toothpaste. Because of their seasoned experience in India, they were able to establish a substantial market share within the first quarter of launching the product and within the first year they became the number one player in the sensitive tooth marketplace. Uh, this kind of success is possible if you understand the Indian consumer very well and if you have a well entrenched distribution and promotion system as Colgate did. So it's something that, that new entrants and people who are growing their business in India can, can aspire to. So what I'm going to do for the balance of the, of, the, of the webinar is really talk about the four P's of marketing as they apply to India. And we have, we have a little more material on some than others, and that's just deliberate because that's, those are the ones where we see people falter the most. So let me talk about an example of a client that hired us some time ago. Uh, this particular client was in the food business, and they had entered India uh, year and a half before they came to us, they found that their sales in year two were much lower than their initial projections had, had led management to believe. So they knew something was wrong and they hired us to figure out what it was. They were quite concerned that perhaps they had not advertised enough or perhaps they were overpriced, but we found very quickly when compare, comparing similar products and asking consumers and retailers that there really wasn't a problem the limited goals that they had for India relative to the pricing of the product as well as the advertising and promotion of the product. The distribution we felt was quite limited, but their projections had been based on that limited dis distribution. So that really wasn't a factor in holding back the sales in our view. We felt that there was something basically lacking or different in the product. So we delved deep into that aspect for this particular client. And what we found was that through anecdotal evidence, it seemed that the, one of the ingredients in the product created a flavor or a taste that Indian consumers didn't like. I can't be more specific than that because of the confidential nature of our work for this client. But suffice it to say that we then went on to run focus groups in four cities across India. We ran some in the north and some towards the coast of India and we found uniformly that this was borne out by consumer tests. There was one ingredient that was causing a particular flavor that was unexpected to the Indian palate and that caused people not to have repeat purchases. They would try the product, they were intrigued by the brand, they were intrigued by the packaging, they were intrigued, intrigued by the name of the product and by some of the point of sale advertising. But they would try it once and they'd say, no, this is not for me. So our recommendation really was to remove this one ingredient. And doing that alone and doing some slight relabeling and point of sale material in a very minimal manner actually caused the repeat purchases to increase dramatically. But the nice part was that they also actually had a reduction in cost. We recommended to our client that they do not reduce the price. So the Manufacturing cost went down while the sales went up. So it became a happy situation for this client in order to be able to grow their uh, their sales. And since then, they have widened the distribution across India. Uh, this was about uh, three years ago that we did the work for this client. 
There's another example from a company that isn't our, our client, Tupperware. They went to India and they realized that their standard product would have limited sale, and so they introduced a couple of products that are very specific to the Indian market. Indians use a lot of spices in their cooking, and uh, many Indian housewives would store the da daily use spices in a container that wasn't sealed, and so the spices would lose their freshness very quickly, and they would have to either grind new spices or keep a separate stash in, in, a, in, in, in a sealed package, and it was quite inconvenient. So they came out with this airtight steel, and uh, this worked far better than the steel or other containers that, that, that had been used in Indian kitchens earlier. Many Indians carry their lunch to work, and because of the nature of Indian food, it makes sense to have a compartmentalized lunch carrier. Such, such carriers did exist in India, but typically they were made of aluminum or metal, and Tupperware came out, came out with a vibrant collection of uh, lunch carriers that, uh, that are suitable for Indian foods, uh, particularly in North India, and this has been quite successful for the company. So again, the idea was to adapt the product and make it appeal to Indian needs. So my takeaway for the product part of uh, succeeding in India is that you have to make your products India ready. You'll have some limited success from selling whatever you sell in the US or other countries when you go to India. And in some cases, you may not have to do a lot of adapting. But in general, you should be ready. If you, going, if you want to have a runaway success in India, so you will find that adapting your products, making them India ready will, will lead to such success. One great example of that is Frito-Lay, the subsidiary of PepsiCo. You can buy Fritos and Lay potato chips in India, but by far their biggest selling brands of chips and snacks in India are not this traditional uh, Cheetos and Fritos that you see on supermarket shelves and in convenience stores in the US. It's actually this brand that they created specifically for India called Kurkure, which means crunchy snack. And they, they went out and looked at Indian snacks and adapted them to the packaging and mass production techniques and have created a whole range of products that have the spices and ingredients that Indians care about uh, and yet are packaged and produced according to Frito-Lay standards. And it's been a huge success. If you go into any Indian city, any convenience store, you'll find a whole rack of Kurkure snacks. So it's been, it's been wonderful for, for PepsiCo and uh, in their success in India. And this came over a period of time. They didn't, didn't figure this out right away. In my book on doing business in India, I also talk about Tropicana and their success in marketing orange juice to India, but I won't dwell on that right now. There are many, many ways in which you need to modify the product depending on which category you are in. If you're in, in home care or in personal care, the needs and uses might be different. In personal care, often, uh, the appeal is through the fragrance, and the Indian nose is very different from from the U.S. Uh, preferences. So you want to you want to adapt to the appropriate flavors and and and, and fragrances that are relevant to India. Uh, this does not mean that American flavors and fragrances won't sell, but you'll be missing out on a good chunk of the market if you don't use the uh, the, 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 the familiar kinds of uh, uh, accents and flavors that Indians are used to. We've also seen this work in home care, not just personal care. Let's move on. Let's talk about promotion and advertising, but before we do that, Supriya, do you think we can run one more poll? Yeah, sure. I'm going to go ahead um, and run a poll, and as we are doing so, again, I would like to encourage our audience to please send us any questions you might have. So the poll I've just launched is uh, to give Gunjan a sense of how much time you've spent in India on business since 20, uh, sorry, uh, 2010. So if you could take a quick minute and vote, um, we can go ahead and get going with the webinar. Have you received any sourcing related questions? Uh, yeah, we have. Let me just... Uh, Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, Gunjan, so you can address this. So 
so how much time have you spent in India on business since uh, 2010? Um, Seventy-one percent of our audience today has spent no time at all, and uh, then the rest is divided between less than 10 days and 11 to 30 days. Okay. So I'm going to continue to assume that everybody is an obvious. It's, it's good to have that feedback. All right. Uh, for those of you who have spent more time, feel free to ask me advanced questions, and I'll be able to address those as well. So let's talk about promotion and advertising. Here is an example of a soap made by Dabur, the company that I mentioned, the largest Indian consumer products company that is purely Indian. And you'll see that in their print ad, they have English text for the most part, but at the bottom left, you'll see a script that you may not recognize, and that's actually Indian. Uh, in fact, you'll see that they are mixing Indian the Indian script with the English. So it says, Aisa glow, soch me dale jo. So the word glow is in English, the rest of the sentence is in Hindi, and what it's saying is your face will glow in, in a way that people will be intrigued. So that's a loose translation of what it's saying. So you might have seen some of this kind of uh, interplay in Hispanic oriented magazines and advertising in the US, but it is rampant across India, where television commercials, print ads, uh, radio ads, will combine multiple languages. And it seems strange to you know, to the Western ear, but that is the way many of the target consumers communicate. And so the, this, this trend was really started with, uh, by PepsiCo about 10 years ago, where they, they created a run, an ad that was a runaway success. And since then, this has actually moved into the mainstream where pretty much any major brand advertising to consumers uh, will consider a mix of multiple languages within the same within the same ad. The other thing that people often assume is that India is a conservative country. And for many, in many ways it is. But the definition of being conservative can be very different from culture to culture. So I was in India a few years ago just leafing through the magazine that was in my hotel room. And it was a traditional family-oriented magazine, much like People or Time magazine or whatever. And I came across this ad, which I scanned and put in here. So you can see that uh, you know it's by no means a conservative ad. In fact, I was making a presentation at a major American company where they actually had me censor this ad because they thought it was it was too risque to show to their employees. But I like to bring this out because you, the assumptions that you might make about India might not be valid. And, and there was no controversy about this kind of ad. There was no movement. First of all, condom advertising has never been controversial in India. But second of all, this this is not a condom ad for population control. This is essentially, you know, a, a very sensual ad, and it was perfectly fine by Indian standards. Uh, so I want to highlight that. Um, India has world-class advertising agencies. Some of them are subsidiaries of Western. Uh, Western agencies through Omnicom and Publicis and so on. And some of them are local homegrown agencies that do very well. Uh, so you will be able to find the right advertising channels uh, for your product and for your marketing plans. What's different also about India is that all media in India is growing. It's not just internet is growing and print is shrinking. No. As more and more Indians are begin, becoming literate, they want to buy newspapers and print magazines. Print magazines are growing in India. Uh, radio, particularly FM radio, is relatively new in India. AM radio has been around for a long time. But on FM radio, you'll see a tremendous opportunity for advertising that may be far more attractive than you might uh, experience in, uh, in Western countries. Advertising standards in India are quite different compared to the US. So here we have this belief that politics and religion shouldn't make it to advertising. But on the bottom left, you see a billboard from a dairy brand called Amul. And their, their advertising has been iconic in India for the last 50 years or so. They have just a few billboards in every major city at the busiest points, you know, the equivalent of Times Square or Sunset Boulevard or, uh, uh, you know, the equivalent in, in, in any major city. And they change these billboards every two weeks with a very topical message, usually having very little to do with the dairy product that they are selling, but something to do with the current situation and somehow tying it in a corny or quirky way to their product. So right after the elections, 
one of the parties that won in, in India across the country was the Bharatiya Janta Party, the BJP. And the symbol for the BJP, just like we have the donkey and the elephant as the symbols for the main political parties in the US. In India, the symbols are actually widespread and used all over the place. The symbol for the BJP is the lotus. So here you see you know, politicians sitting on top of a lotus and uh, the message that this party's favorite butter is Amul butter. Now, it, 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 it's not that they have a preference for any, any political party. If the other party had won, they would have created an equally quirky uh, billboard uh, highlighting that party. Uh, the, this particular brand has run billboards on some of the most controversial and sensitive topics, uh, and they are the talk of the town every every other week. Most Indians want to see, you know, what Amul has to say today. Uh, many of these can be found on their website. So if anybody is curious, I can send you a link to their uh, to their billboard museum online, and it's quite entertaining to look at the range of things that uh, this company has done. The other very important tendency in India is towards endorsements, typically by sporting stars or by movie stars. And by sports, I mean in India, there's just one sport that people care about compared to most others, and that is cricket. So if you are a famous cricketer, you can get endorsement deals from dozens, if not hundreds of brands. And likewise, if you're a movie star. So here we see a minor star, the Mirza, uh, endorsing a Unilever product uh, with a curious title of Pond's White Beauty Detox Cream. Uh, you'll see this kind of advertising all over the country uh, in terms of billboards, print, as well as events. Uh, let's now switch to distribution. And this is the area where many American companies falter because when they look at India, uh, they want to see it through a familiar lens, and that'll get you into trouble. So our familiar lens is really the supermarket uh, store with aisles and you know that started getting big in this country back in the 1920s and 30s and really scaled through the Great Depression and became the, the dominant way in which Americans bought their retail product. So you will see in India this, this, this kind of marketing is called modern retail. And you see an example of our client with, with, their, with their display inside of a modern a retail store in, in the Delhi area. You'll see that it's the same black and green uh, colors that they use in the US. They emphasize the California brand, so it's got 100% California. The guy uh, handing out the samples is wearing you know, a uniform that matches the, the brand. Whereas on the right side, you see the same product being sold in a traditional Indian store uh, with very you know, ordinary looking shelves, and the product is sitting along with some chocolate candy and some, some uh, local brands that aren't particularly attractively packaged. Well, the reality is that traditional stores of the kind on the right make up more than 90% of the sales that happen at the retail level in India. So if you're entering India and you only want to focus on modern retail as many, many American brands want to because that's what is familiar to them, you're only touching 10% of the market. And that 10% has also become very demanding in terms of slotting fees and this and that. So you're competing with many, many other entrants. Whereas if you also consider part of the traditional retail, you can actually do very well. Uh, so our, our, our client in this particular case, this is public knowledge, has actually played in both fields and, and have done very well as a result. I mentioned Pepsi briefly in, in terms of their Frito-Lay subsidiary, but in terms of their uh, drink products, both juices as well as sodas, uh, they have set up a very wide distribution network. Pepsi distributors directly distribute into all towns that have a population of over 5,000. And they've set up both a forward distribution as well as a reverse mechanism to collect returnable bottles, because India still has some, some of that kind of flow with glass bottles that, that come back to the bottlers. And all of that has worked very well for Pepsi. Coke has a similar setup as do other companies. Uh, it takes quite a bit of scale to be able to set that up. And uh, uh, transportation in India is, is, is a challenge. You'll see that on another slide. So it, it takes, uh, this is not something that you would set up as a new entrant, but, but you can get there over time. Another big success in India has been Amway. Their sales now are close to $500 million. 
it took a while for them to get to this point and they had to do things in India that they had never done before. They had to set up warehouses, they had to set up locations where the customer could come in and pick up the product and experience it, touch it, feel it. Uh, this is not something that they had done typically in other countries. But once they made that kind of commitment, and once they realized that a mail order kind of strategy alone was not going to work, that they found that, uh, that they could have quite a bit of success. Just last year, uh, William Pinckney, the CEO for India, committed to $100 million expansion. They're putting up a factory in the southern city of Chennai, and they expect that Indian sales will soon reach a billion dollars. Uh, they're going to manufacture in India and sell the product to other countries in the region as well, uh, because the economics justifies that. So you'll see that across Asia and maybe into Africa, products made for Ambe will be shipped from the Indian factory. Distribution has been a key element of their success uh, in India. So as, as I go about the cities of India, I like to take snapshots when I can, kind of illustrating the various modes of distribution. And one thing that my clients always find funny is that McDonald's delivers in India. And so they take these little uh, scooters and remove the back seat and install this uh, uh, this container, and so you can order your uh, Maharaja Mac, as they don't have Big Mac in India because uh, Indians don't eat beef very much. Uh, so they, you can order your Maharaja Chicken Mac and your fries, and somebody will bring it to your office or your home a few minutes later. This picture here with the tricycle uh, is the guy delivering eggs in the in, in the heart of Chennai on 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 uh, the tricycle. The bottom here is. Uh, is the Pepsi distribution happening with uh, with the little truck? You'll see they don't use the large trucks in India, so the little trucks can make it through the narrow streets in the cities of India. And this picture on the left is not mine. This is interestingly enough off of the CIA website. They have a small collection of photos, and I guess some CIA officer was was impressed how hay is being transported across uh, one of India's highways. Um, so India has a disjointed distribution system. Uh, it's multi-layer, getting product from the factory to the consumer or from the port. If you're importing product into India to the consumer, it will change hands many times. You may end up having dozens or hundreds of distributors. You may have one importer, perhaps, but dozens or hundreds of distributors. You may have agents, sub-agents, stockists, sub-stockists. There's a whole range and hierarchy that you will go through before the product reaches the average urban or rural consumer. There are over 6 million retail outlets in India. And as I indicated earlier, most of them are traditional or mom and pop single location outlets. So one of the connotations of this is your product had better be packaged robustly. So if it ends up on a hand pushed cart like this, and this is a picture I took in India's national capital. This is not some little town that you, you want to be sure that it survives the packaging, uh, it survives the transportation, and makes it to the consumer in a manner that looks halfway decent. So uh, you, you may want to look at the way that you package the product and uh, deal with the heat and humidity factors and, and multiple handling and so on. Many Indian consumers expect their products to be delivered at home. Uh, and this is the, the large number of small retail stores and labor being cheap in India, that's not hard to do. But that has an implication into how you package the product, what the SKU size should be, and, and how it's going to be handled, and what the consumer will see. Many Indian consumers will never actually go step foot in a store. They'll just pick up the, their mobile phone and call the retailer and say, I need this, this, and this. And so they're very much amenable to suggestions from the retail sales staff, uh, because they're going to buy something new pretty much blind, or at least get it on trial through the retailer's recommendations. And that's something that many American companies don't factor as much as they should in my view. All right, let's move to our last P for pricing. And I have just one slide about that because this is, an, is a function that many people already think about. Uh, and we are talking about Procter & Gamble, which is the largest consumer product company in the US but certainly by no means are they the largest in India. They were they had a fairly small business for a while, and then the previous CEO, Bob McDonald, made a huge commitment to India, 
since then, A.G. Laffrey has taken over as CEO and has confirmed the investment that they're making in India. They're active in many categories now. Uh, fabric care is one of their staples. They do quite a bit in working shampoos. They're active to some extent in baby care. They just recently introduced some toothpaste and toothbrushes. And the Gillette business was active in India long before Procter & Gamble bought them. But I'll talk briefly about, about some innovative things that they did since the P&G buyout. They are looking at growing their market in India so that the per capita spend goes up to $20 a consumer compared to $1 per consumer where it was sitting a couple of years ago when they shared this information with the public. So they're looking at a huge growth path. Um, the shampoo business is one where Pantene and Head and & Shoulders have done well, but it's not your traditional shampoo bottles. And again, Procter & Gamble did not invent this, but the sachet where you have a single-use uh, shampoo package uh, that sells for somewhere between you know, 5 and 7 cents is the dominant volume and, and value method of selling shampoo. So 60% of the shampoo sold in India by value is sold in these single-use sachets. And uh, they have done very well with doing this for Pantene. I believe we've seen single-use single packages of head and shoulders as well. PNG sells both aerial and tide in India. And they found that they had much greater success when they reformulated the product and reduced the price of Tide by about 20% and Aerial by about 40%. And then they achieved the very, very high volume. Now, they don't sell Crest toothpaste in India, by the way. They already were selling the Oral-B toothbrushes. So when they decided to launch a toothpaste in India, they actually branded it as Oral-B. And it's at a different price point than you might be used to buying at your grocery store or at Walmart. So the Product introduction was at a dollar and dollar sixty per tube. Uh, this just happened about a year ago, year two, year or two ago, and the product is doing relatively well. Colgate Palmolive is still the, the, the dominant player, but uh, their toothpaste is, is is doing reasonably well in India. There's a very interesting case study about Gillette, and if you if you go to hbr.org, the Harvard Business Review site, and Google the word, uh, I mean search for the word uh, Gillette Guard. The study will come up. The, the Boston-based Gillette team actually traveled to India and watched Indian consumers as to how they shave and how differently they shave, and then came back with a low-cost, very innovative design from scratch with far fewer moving parts and um, far fewer parts than an American razor has. And it was kind of a good enough, not a great product, but priced at a level where the, Indian, the average lower middle class Indian consumer would want to buy this as opposed to their legacy solution, which didn't involve safety blades at all. And they've actually had quite a bit of success doing that. So the message here, again, is that they've priced it right for India. They've designed it for India. And they have then achieved the volumes that PNG needs to be able to justify this kind of investment. So Pierre, do we have questions at this point? Yes, Gunjan. We actually have a couple of questions um, uh, sent in by Tommy, uh, which relate to this last section. So let's uh, address them right now. Uh, the first question that Tommy has um, relates to your slide on the uh, multiple uh, language use. Uh, the question is, does Hindi work all over India, or do ads have to have a local language together with English? That's a great question. So about 40% of the country, uh, Hindi is you know, by population, about 40% of the country uh, is Hindi speaking. And in those regions, you might have your television commercials uh, be in Hindi. The product itself, the packaging on the product doesn't have to be in Hindi. Most products sold on the shelves in India will have only English. Uh, some may have English and Hindi, uh, but very few will have more languages than that, uh, with the exception of some regional brands. Uh, if you're going to do television advertising in southern India or in eastern India, you may want to use local languages. Um, companies such as Western Union advertises only in local and regional languages across the country. But there's also sometimes you'll just buy national national advertising that runs in you know over on direct to home 
uh, satellite or cable, and that might only be in Hindi. So that's also possible. Now, print advertising, of course, depending on the publication, is often in English. Uh, so you have this mix of, of various languages depending on the purpose of your advertising and the approach. Most PR will typically start in English. Great. I hope that Thank answers you. Tommy's question. Did he have a second question? He did. He did. Uh, so the second question is, uh, we have heard that India is a young nation and that young people are more interested in brands, in other brands, than in the past. Does this mean that Indian citizens would rather see Western brands than domestic brands? If a new brand is developed, should, should it have a touch of urban young Indian people rather than a touch of Western style? That's a great question. And I, I think the answer is yes to all of the above. <laughs> first, first of all, I'm not saying that Indian young people are more prone to trying new things compared to Western young people. I'm just saying there's more young people in India than there are in the US, far, far more proportionally and far more in numbers. So you you have a bigger pool to play with in terms of the, uh, the ability to try new brands. Indian consumers are, one of my friends who used to run the Levi's business in India characterized this very well. He said Indian youth can be looked upon as having a Western shell with an Indian core. So depending on what you want to do, you can appeal to the Western shell and you'll get some good business. But if, if your product has to appeal to the core values, sometimes you need to get to the Indian core as well. And those things will work just as well. Both Western companies and Indian companies who are successful in India now understand this nuance very well. So you will see Indian companies, ITC, whom I mentioned earlier, has personal care brands that have a very American feel. Even though the product has been developed exclusively in India for the Indian consumer, the ads and the promotion and the packaging is very much as if it were designed in the West for the West. And that's the market segment that they are trying to appeal to. On the other hand, I also showed you the Hammam soap earlier made by a Western company, Unilever. And the advertising, the messaging is all about herbal and traditional and Indian. Some of Unilever's shampoos also play upon that, and some of their food products play upon that as well. So uh, there is a segment that is driven by Western values. There's also a segment that is driven by traditional and Indian values. And you can make money in both of them. Uh, it's a nuanced answer. Uh, but I, I think this this is what you have to realize in a growing market. There's, it, it's all about segmenting the market correctly and then being able to address it. Great. Thank you, Gunjan. OK, so let me uh, jump here, because we're going to skip the product development portion, since nobody is interested in that. And let me just get to the sourcing slide. Um, there's Tremendous amount of business happening now around sourcing uh, for consumer product companies in India. Now, sometimes this is regional, as I described, for Amway. But much of it is driven by Western markets. So people typically think of, uh, of China as the place where goods are made. But India has a vibrant manufacturing and production base. The current government in India has a huge campaign called Make in India. And they are committed to making India an equal player in manufacturing compared to China. And it's driven by the need to create 100 million, 200 million new jobs over the next 5 to 10 years. And services alone will not do it. So as I talk to consumer product companies, you know, we've done work for Kraft, we've done work for Clorox, we've done for many, many, many Western companies. And they have concerns when they look at China, typically about intellectual property issues. Many also have concerns about the safety records of Chinese manufacturing plants. When you're in the food business, when you're making products for kids, those become really showstoppers in case there's a problem. Uh, there are other issues and concerns about China as well. And so India becomes a good alternative uh, to consider for many of these uh, types of situations. People are going to India for ingredients. And there, of course, it, you, know, you have to look at the kind of products that, uh, that can be grown or are manufactured in India. Uh, 
big big success story is Metamucil, which uh, used to be a Procter and Gamble brand. The key ingredient in that is psyllium, which is only grown in the western Indian states of Gujarat and Rajasthan, and uh, product is imported into this country. Psyllium had been used as a as a fiber product in India for centuries, and now it is sold as a branded uh, western oriented product. Many many uh, companies are looking to India for packaging innovation and packaging materials as well. Uh, so there's there's a number of possibilities, whether you are in home care, foods, or personal care, you can find ingredients, products, as well as design services, packaging services that you can leverage from India. Um, so let's address the supply chain or sourcing questions, if any. Uh, we have a question from um, Helena um, who's asking, do you have any insights on the attitude of Indian consumers, uh, it's specifically towards vitamins and nutritional supplements? Are there any brands with traditional um, herbal products? So let me take no, the first part of the question, and then, then we'll address the second. So we, if you look at our website, you'll see one of our clients is, is Nordic Naturals. Uh, and they make the omega-3 supplements sold at a fairly significant premium. Uh, and, and I think they will let me say this publicly, that they've, they've been quite impressed with the interest in the Indian consumer uh, relating to their products across the major cities of India. Uh, so you'll start seeing their product in India very soon. Uh, there are other, other vitamin and supplement brands that are Western that are already present in India. If you go to the pharmacies and stores, you'll see them. Indians have historically been had an affinity to uh, locally uh, locally grown and sourced traditional remedies uh, out of the Ayurvedic and and other pharmacopoeias in India, and so of course those are very popular in India. Many of them were sold in a very traditional, uh, informal manner, but companies such as Dabur have uh, streamlined that process and started selling those products as branded, uh, branded and. Uh, uh, high-end uh, kind of uh, offerings. Uh, there's a comp there's a woman named Shahnaz Hussain that has a thriving business. It's a privately held company with her own name, and uh, she has a thriving personal care business with uh, herbal and, uh, uh, and, and and branded products that does very well. Uh, what was the second part of Helene's question? Uh, the second um, part was, uh, you know, are there? I think you kind of answered if there are any local brands with traditional herbal products. Yeah, so I mentioned China's Hussein. Another brand is Himalaya out of Bangalore. They do extremely well, and they are also priced. Uh, they are they're premium package, premium priced. But there are many, many other brands. And Helen, if you send me a, a, an email, we can address that question in more detail, depending on your on your current situation. Okay, any other questions on sourcing related issues? Uh, not not yet, and we should continue since we are kind of um, going okay. over time. Yeah, yeah, we are just at the end of the webinar. So uh, as ne next steps, you might ask us through email for a copy of our report that's about a year old called Making a Splash in India's CPG Market. Uh, it's normally available for $195, but if you attended this webinar live, we will make it available to you at no charge during the next week. So if there's something that you want, uh, just drop an email at the address at the bottom, usaatomlet.com. We'll be happy to send that to you. We'll also send you my Harvard Business Review article on succeeding in India's consumer marketplace. That was a couple of years old, but I think everything in there is still very much valid. Uh, we've listed some of the things that we do. And again, this is not a webinar selling our services. People often have questions about regulatory issues, about hiring country managers and distributors and pricing, sourcing technology scouting, all of those are things that we can make happen for you. Great. So. Gunjan, actually, there's a, just a question that's just come up from Joanne, um, uh, since you just mentioned it. Uh, she's asking uh, if uh, you help with hiring and what is your advice to hire the right people? And then we have another question after that as well. OK. So uh, typically, when a company is starting out in India or they are expanding their business significantly, uh, the first few key hires, you know, the head of sales, head of marketing, country manager, uh, head of distribution, uh, PR, you know, those types of positions are where 
we can be of most value, first of all, in defining the job description to make it adapted to Indian needs and, and to the Western company's uh, way of operation. And secondly, in determining whether you should send an expatriate, whether you should hire someone in India, whether you should hire someone with Western experience or with Indian experience in India, should they work for a J and J or a Colgate or should they work for a Dabur? You know those those basic parameters, and then we can actually help on the ground with finding candidates, interviewing them, and making recommendations in conjunction with our client. So that's a service that we offer routinely. Uh, it's typically part of a larger engagement. We don't see ourselves as headhunters per se, but part of the success in India depends on having the right people, and that's the part that we can help uh, help provide from from group to nut. Uh, and what was the second part? Uh, no, this was actually from somebody else. Uh, we have a question from Doug, who's asking about uh, what regulatory approvals might be needed before uh, we can sell in India. Is CE mark sufficient, or is FDA approval required, uh, and so on? Okay, so that depends on the category of product. If you are in the home care business, unless you have chemicals or insecticides or you know, things of that nature involved, home care products are fairly easy to register and sell in India. If you're looking at personal care, until just a couple of years ago, it was there was almost no regulation. But now that there is some degree of registration and uh, and uh, filing of ingredients and, and, and some, some disclosure that is required, it's something that we can easily handle for, for our clients. However, if you're in the food business, it's been a rough ride. Anything that goes into your mouth, the last couple of years have been a rough ride. Uh, there's an agency called the Food Service and Safety Authority of India, FSSAI. And a couple of years ago, they determined that products that predated their existence also had to be registered, which would have created this huge backlog of product registration and approvals that the agency was just not staffed to handle. So there was a legal challenge to this, and uh, this went into the high courts of India and finally got resolved, where the government was essentially defeated and the, the corporations, uh, the Indian corporations got their way. And so now registration processes have just opened up recently and started moving forward. Uh, the new government that is in power in India is very committed to streamlining all regulations, and we are hoping that with their you know, as they begin executing on their promise that food regulation will also move forward much more rapidly. I don't think it will go back to the good old days where you could pretty much bring anything into India and sell it because there is a legitimate concern about safety and about uh, ingredients and what you know, what's appropriate and what's not. So, uh, so I think there will continue to be some degree of regulation. But it, you know, we are hoping that within, within a few months it will become much more streamlined than it has been over the last few years. Great, thank you. And we have uh, one last question that has come in from Tommy. Thank you for being so interactive, Tommy. Um, he's asking, this is a tricky question, but I would just like to know if you have heard if the law for pro prohibiting uh, foreign investment in e-commerce is about to change. So in a sense, Foreign companies are active in e-commerce to some degree already. You might have heard that Amazon has an investment in India and others, but what you don't have is what they call multi-brand retail. And I tend not to go by rumors. So yeah, there's a lot of talk that uh, the whole area of multi-brand retail, whether it's in stores or online, will open up much more vigorously. But I think we have to wait and watch what happens. The next big event that we have to wait for is when the Indian Finance Minister Arun Jaitley releases his budget for the next fiscal year. The Indian fiscal year begins on April 1st, and on the last day of February is when the Finance Ministry announces its plans for changes in tax rates, for collection of revenue, and for any other major uh, regulatory financial related issues. It is possible that we might see an announcement related to this at that time. It is also possible, and in my view likely, that we won't see anything at that time. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's best to wait and watch and see what happens. 
there are means by which you can get products into India electronics, you know, through, through electronic sales. And again, Tommy, if uh, if you have specific questions about about your company and your product, uh, just drop us an email uh, so that uh, you don't necessarily have to wait unless unless you want to set up your own e-commerce retail entity in India. Uh, and then that's a different question. But other than that, uh, this should not limit you right now from making you know, from making sales into India. Great. Thank you, Gunjan. And uh, thank you. Um, I think we need to wrap up now. I think people <laughs> are uh, uh, trying to leave. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar today. We hope it was informative. If you have any additional questions, please do email us at usa at amrit.com. Uh, as you exit the webinar, uh, you may be asked to complete a brief survey, and we would really appreciate your feedback with regards to this webinar. If you have any friends or colleagues who you think might benefit from a similar webinar, please have them register on our website, www.amrit.com, and we will notify them of any upcoming webinars. Thank you very much for attending today, and have a nice day. Goodbye.